Mixed martial arts really did start as a fringe extreme sport that you apparently only watched if blood sport just didn't have enough blood in it for you. I don't know if you've noticed, but MMA is so hot right now. And we didn't get here magically overnight, but the sport's popularity has pretty much exploded recently. But how did we get here? And how did this all happen? Well, I'm Balian from MMA On Point, and let's talk about the 10 things that accelerated the growth of MMA. Number 10, pro wrestling. You can have whatever opinion you want on pro wrestling, but millions of people around the globe have for many years been enjoying the kayfabe and enjoying the spectacle of two people, uh, do, do we say fighting? I mean, before the UFC even got started, pro wrestling was already massive. You know, you had Hulk Hogan, Andre the Giant, and that's not even considering Japan, where MMA was basically born from the world of pro wrestling. Shuto had risen to popularity within the Japanese wrestling world, and there were promoters and martial artists who wanted to focus more on actual combat, so they began organizing shoot fights a alongside the pro wrestling matches, which to be honest, it actually all got a bit confusing because no one knew what was a real fight and what was worked. But it blurred the lines so much that eventually a lot of wrestlers like Sakuraba, Funaki and Suzuki just transitioned over to MMA and they brought their fans with them. And they literally started one of the first promotions, Pancrase, with the moniker, We Are Hybrid Wrestlers. I mean, they even kept rope breaks as part of their rule set. Pride FC was pretty much created by Nobuhiku Takada, who was the biggest pro wrestling star in Japan at the time. If you go take a look at some of the early rings, bouts, they were recorded as MMA fights, but they're basically just light rolling, letting each other go for submissions. But it built a fan base. In the dark ages of American MMA, there were crossover stars like Ken Shamrock, and that continued with Brock Lesnar. I mean, maybe CM Punk, people like that guy, right? But Brock was the guy who set the pay-per-view record at 1.6 million buys, and it wasn't beaten for about 10 years, and that was by McGregor Diaz too. Pro wrestling's popularity and its acceptance in mainstream culture had already fostered a community of combat sports fans who didn't even know how ready they were to just bleed. Number nine, celebrity endorsement. You can bet if there's a celebrity in attendance at a UFC event, they're gonna show them on camera at some point. Why? Because if it's good enough for George Clooney and the US president, then it's good enough for you with your corn nuts and Modelo Especial. I mean, let's face it, any famous person putting their name behind anything is gonna make you more interested in it, whether that's Betty White selling Snickers or Justin Gaethje telling you to protect yourselves at all times. Thanks, J-Man. It's not like the UFC has relied on celebrity endorsements, but as early as the Chuck Liddell days, having superstar actors or other pro athletes in attendance, it just adds to the spectacle of the fight. And in the early days, Carmen Electra not only guaranteed extra viewership, but also became a great spokesperson for the sport. I mean, Joe Rogan wasn't the celebrity he is now when he first started working with the UFC, but you can't ignore the amount of eyes he brought to the sport as he's grown his own platform alongside of it. Also, who can forget UFC 264, where the literal president of the United States, Donald Trump, showed up? If anything, there's more celebrity endorsement these days. I mean, we've seen the UFC work alongside The Rock to introduce branded apparel and even present the BMF world title. And shit, apparently they give Chris Pratt post-fight interviews now. Number eight, blue chip sponsors. You just can't get away from adverts these days, can you? Rest in peace, pre-2017 YouTube. But we are initiated, aren't we, Bruce? But the right advertisement can do more than just bring you a lump sum of cash. Mm, then. An official product or business sponsoring your organization can make it legit. Now, this is something the UFC has greatly benefited from. I mean, yes, they also had Condom Depot and Dude Wipes, but to be honest, that's two things the fan base desperately needs. Budweiser was a massive deal for the UFC. It's one of the biggest beer companies in the world, and they endorsed the UFC for several years. They pretty much picked the biggest stars the UFC had and gave them their own commercials. Conor McGregor had one, Ronda Rousey, of course. Heck, even John Jones and Dana White shared to brew together. Don't ask Brock Lesnar to drink it though. I'm gonna drink a Coors Light. That's a Coors Light because Bud Light won't pay me nothing. Burger King got involved, so did Harley Davidson, to the point where on multiple occasions, they've just given motorbikes away to UFC athletes. You also can't ignore the appearance of UFC fighters in mainstream movies like GSP in Captain America or Ronda Rousey in Fast and Furious. So I do that, I do that blah, blah. Excuse me, uh, the, uh, the fuck did you just say? All these big brands putting their label on the UFC certainly helped legitimize it as a sport and definitely brought more eyes to the promotion and recently they've signed their biggest sponsorship ever with crypto.com a reported 175 million dollars so yes obviously as well as everything else these sponsors also bring in money which no shit is going to help when running a fight promotion number seven video games you might not know this, but the first ever UFC game called simply Ultimate Fighting Championship came out in the year 2000, and it won Best Fighting Game at E3 that year, which is a pretty fucking big deal, guys, okay? In the year 2000, the UFC wasn't even on pay-per-view, let alone television. They basically had VHS tapes, and that was it. So a video game release, one that was actually pretty good and well-received, brought the UFC to a new fan base on a massive scale. The video game can teach you about all the different fighters, what different strikes and techniques are, and where different submissions can 
can be performed in different positions. It really did help to educate a whole generation of UFC fans. And heck, you could argue that even continues today. Eventually, though, the UFC partnered up with EA, who brought a ton more to the table in terms of resources and promotional reach. There were a few controversies with fighter likeness disputes. I mean, there was that time fighters at the American Kickboxing Academy refused to allow their likeness to be used, which eventually led to John Fitch and Christian Wellish being cut from the promotion. UFC 4 sold very well, and the contract with EA is set to last another eight years, meaning, yeah, we are going to get more UFC games, and they'll continue to bring new eyes and, I guess, understanding to the sport. Also, this is a chance to plug the ESFL Live esports event we had in Las Vegas this summer for UFC 4. The UFC has already been testing the esports waters, so look out for more of that in the future as well. Number six, the crossover stars. The UFC is a massive worldwide household name, but as popular as it is, there has really only been two fighters who managed to cross over into mainstream culture and basically transcend the sport. Now, really, we're talking about Conor McGregor and Ronda Rousey. People like John Jones, Daniel Cormier, of course, Nate Diaz have appeared on talk shows like Conan O'Brien, but the fame of McGregor and Rousey just hit on a different level. At the height of her career, little kids were dressing up as Ronda Rousey for Halloween. She was getting movie appearances, judo throwing every TV host in America, and was advertising brands like Carl's Jr., Metro PCS, heck, even Twizzlers. And all of that just fed back into the UFC where she was an undefeated champion. And Conor McGregor was no different. After he became the first UFC champ champ and challenged Floyd Mayweather, which sold over 4 million pay-per-views, by the way, he was one of, if not, the most recognizable athletes on the planet. He was doing crazy shit like that Game of War commercial. I'll find you and make you kiss my feet. Monster Energy, Burger King. Connor was plastered across our TV screens. A UFC pay-per-view is usually only as big as the stars headlining it, and it's not surprising that after all that exposure, the pay-per-view numbers of both Connor and Rousey shot way up. And that's to say nothing of people like Brock Lesnar, who brought existing fan bases over to the UFC as well. The UFC will will always keep on turning, but it's pretty much undeniable the impact the crossover stars have had. Number five, the internet community. It's been going pretty strong since the birth of the internet, and at first everyone kind of congregated in one place, the underground. It was a go-to forum to discuss events, upcoming fights, drama, heck, even argue with your favorite MMA fighter. It gave the community a place to come together and share their passions, not always in a nice way. Sherdog was also super popular, created by photographer Jeff Sherwood in 1997. He started uploading some of the awesome pictures he took at events, but it also had message boards, user forums, event reviews, even rankings. These days, MMA Twitter is a pretty awesome place to be, there's people live tweeting during events, sharing memes, which all generally helps promote and popularize the sport. If someone gets a viral knockout, it goes live in seconds. Dana White's Tuesday Night Contender Series was trending number two worldwide on Twitter the other week, and it's basically thanks to the MMA internet. And this all goes hand in hand with people like Ariel Hawani and his interviews, which have taken many forms over the years, and other YouTube channels, all of whom give the community a place to chit-chat, talk shit, but also just be fans of the sport. Y'all ever heard of Fight Front? If you're watching fights alone, there's companion streams. If you need closure, there's post-event discussions. And you can do it all from the comfort of your own home. Yeah, we owe the MMA community a lot. And that includes you. So why don't you just give yourself a big old pat on the back? Oh, yeah. Number four, Dana White. Some people love him, others might hate him, but it's pretty undeniable that Dana White has basically rammed down the door of anything that might stop the growth of the UFC. I'm a savage. I mean, let's not forget, it was he who convinced the Fatida brothers to buy the organization in the first place, and they handed it off to him to turn a fringe illegal sport into a global entertainment monopoly. And he had to pull a few strings just to keep it afloat at first, which led to him getting creative, and after sitting in a meeting with his staff until 2 a.m., he drew up the layout for the Ultimate Fighter, something that would completely pull the UFC out of the dark ages and resuscitate the sport. As this thing grew and grew, Dana and his negotiating abilities helped secure TV deals with prominent networks like Spike, not just for the Ultimate Fighter, but cable shows like UFC Unleashed and UFC Countdown. Later, he secured Fox and now ESPN, which is pretty much as big as it gets. He pushed for the UFC to go international. He turned Brazil and Canada into amazing markets for the company, almost going back to back, packing out the 55,000 seater stadium in Montreal for GSP Shields. And then the return to Rio card at UFC 134. That was a massive event for Brazilian MMA. He started buying out the competitors, WEC, Strike Force, of course Pride, which all brought a stacked roster, just making the UFC that much better each time. Of course, during the pandemic, when the whole world shut down, Dana basically just ignored everybody else and brought the UFC back before any other sporting organization on the planet. Honestly, I'm not sure what we're going to do when he retires. I think Tommy Toehold can do a good job, though. Number three, legislation. 
You'd think adding more rules to a sport that at the time sort of attracted the most hardcore of sports fans wouldn't necessarily be the best move. The UFC had one objective with its early marketing, to basically convince everyone that this was as close to a fight to the death as you could possibly get and nothing was off the table in terms of what you could do to your opponent. But then Dana White and the Fatita brothers stepped in in January 2001 and purchased the UFC from SEG and started turning things around. I'm the captain now. Literally three months later, they got together with the New Jersey State Athletic Board to discuss adopting a set of standard rules for this new sport called mixed martial arts. And boom, we actually had, for the first time in history, an agreed upon set of rules that regulatory bodies could use to sanction the sport. This changed everything. Slowly but surely, the sport worked its way back into the mainstream. They got back on pay-per-view and eventually TV. Sure, they had to adopt a scoring system that we complain about basically every weekend, but that's better than pulling a blockbuster, I suppose. Number two, the COVID pandemic. While the entire sporting world went into shutdown, the UFC, well, mainly Dana White, I guess, refused to lay low, and they were the only major sports league in the US to run during the pandemic. And they were the first to welcome a full capacity crowd at UFC 261 in Florida. They had about three months where they were pretty much the only sport on television, and it boosted viewership and fandom in an unfathomable way. It didn't matter that the arenas were empty, and for the first time in history, there were no fans watching. Around the world, people were tuning in, and of course, gambling on the only sport going. The controversial nature as well surrounding the UFC's return only helped bring more eyes to the organization. The world was in lockdown, but yet Dana and the UFC had found a way to navigate and hold events safely, created a bubble on Yaz Island and in the UFC Apex. Since coming back from the pandemic, they have sold out a staggering 21 shows consecutively, and for some of them, the tickets disappear in minutes. The last pay-per-view, 277, was held in Dallas. The last time UFC were there was for Tyron Woodley, Darren Till. It was a pretty big fight. It did $2 million at the gate. 277 just did 4.5 million. That's absolutely insane. The London event in March went down as the highest grossing fight night in UFC history. They are killing it across the board and the pandemic really does have a big part to play in that. Number one, major TV deals. So after getting banned on pretty much every television set in the country, it was a slow crawl to get the UFC to where it is now. They got back on pay-per-view, which is great, but it wasn't enough to keep the boat afloat. They needed to get on TV, free TV if possible. Fortunately though, in 2002, the UFC had an opportunity to make its television debut on the best damn sports show period on Fox Sports. The only problem was they didn't want a whole fight card, just one fight. Who did the UFC choose to represent the entire industry at this pivotal time? Why, ruthless Robbie Lawler, of course. He was just 20 years old with the pressure of an entire sport on his shoulders, but holy shit, the fight delivered. They showed everything MMA and Robbie ended it in a knockout. It drew the second biggest audience in the best damn sports show history. This led to more opportunities. They even filled in on Sunday night boxing fight slots with taped footage, and they were given the chance to promote the UFC 40 pay-per-view between Ken Shamrock and Tito, which turned out to be massive for the company. But the door was open. Eventually, Dana negotiated a long-term deal with Spike TV, which led to the Ultimate Fighter that once again saved the UFC. After that, they moved back to Fox, bringing the UFC to even more homes across the US. To kick things off, I'd like to introduce the, the distinguished executives. And here we are today with the UFC on ESPN with just about every other major sport. Just have letters UFC pop up and enter the mainstream audience consciousness alongside the other programming on ESPN, that's massive. This new nationwide accessibility time perfectly with a pandemic that took out all of the other ESPN programming meant the UFC became their new golden child. They saw a 66% increase in their ESPN Plus subscription service over the next year, and the UFC were a massive part of that. Cheers to the boy Luke Taylor for editing this one and putting lovely pictures and videos to these words. You can find him on Twitter at calltome underscore. And once again, thank you to the guitar noodling skills of Ben Rosette and that song in the intro. You can find him at Ben Rosette and on streaming services everywhere. If you enjoyed this video and my ramblings, go ahead, give us a thumbs up, hit the like button. And if you haven't subscribed yet, I don't know what you're doing.